Here I've got this nice problem that was long listed for the International Math Olympiad, and I think this is going to be a fairly quick video. So our goal is to find all polynomials p of x satisfying the following equation. So we've got p evaluated at x minus 1 times p evaluated at x plus 1 equals p evaluated at x squared minus 1. So obviously we can take this x squared minus 1 and factor it into x minus 1 times x plus 1. And that would mean there's some multiplicative property between x minus 1, x plus 1, and this polynomial p. So I bet that's really only reserved for very special polynomials. Okay, before we get started looking for a more general solution, I want to start by noticing there are two obvious solutions, which we'll just state right now and not really worry about talking about anymore. And that would be p of x equals the zero polynomial and p of x equals the constant polynomial one. Notice they both definitely satisfy this equation. That's obviously because zero times zero is zero and one times one is one. Okay, so now that we've got that out of the way, let's look for other solutions. So let's maybe suppose that alpha is a root of our polynomial p of x. So what I mean by that is that p evaluated at alpha is equal to zero. I guess there are constant polynomials with zero roots, but we've only covered but we've already covered all constant polynomials that would satisfy this rule. Okay, so we've got p of alpha equals x, but we really need to put this into terms that we can use this functional equation. But that's not too hard. We can rewrite alpha as alpha plus 1 minus 1, right? So we've got p of alpha plus 1 minus 1 equals 0. Now we'll take our green boxed equation over here and evaluate it at x equals alpha plus one. So maybe I'll write that out a little bit. We've got p of x minus one times p of x plus one equals p of x squared minus one. Now we'll set x equal to alpha plus one and see what we get. So over here we get zero just from our discussion above, and then over here we'll get p evaluated at alpha plus 1 squared minus 1. Okay, but that tells us that alpha plus 1 squared minus 1 is also a root. So that means if we start with a root alpha, we get a new root, which is alpha plus 1 squared minus 1. But now we'll keep playing this game. We'll take this equation again, but now we'll set x equal to alpha plus 1 squared. So you might say, well, why alpha plus 1 squared? That's because we want to end up with this alpha plus 1 squared minus 1 inside of p right here. So let's see. On the left-hand side, that will give us 0, like kind of for obvious reasons because of what we found out over here. And then on the right-hand side, we'll get p evaluated at alpha plus 1 to the fourth power minus 1. So that means we've got a third root to this polynomial. We've got alpha plus 1 to the fourth minus 1 is also a root. But now we can continue this inductively. So iteratively or inductively, what this implies is that alpha plus 1 to the 2 to the k minus 1 is a root for all k bigger than or equal to 0. So notice k equals 0 gives us our original root alpha. We get alpha minus 1 plus 1. K 
k equals 1 gives us this root that was generated by one application through our green boxed equation. And then k equals 2 gives us this second root which was generated by a second time through this green boxed equation. So k times through that equation and we'll get this is also a root. But notice that's infinitely many roots. Well, unless alpha takes on some very special values. And so let's maybe bring that fact to the top and we'll finish it off. Okay, so far we've determined that if alpha is a root of our polynomial, then so is alpha plus 1 to the 2 to the k minus 1 for all natural numbers k. But that's pretty problematic because it looks like we've constructed infinitely many roots of our polynomial. But the only polynomial with infinitely many roots is the zero polynomial. But we've already taken care of the case of the zero polynomial, so we're assuming this is not the zero polynomial. So now we want to think about what special values of alpha will make this list only contain finitely many elements. And let's look at this. Okay, well, alpha equals zero is an obvious possibility. That'll leave us with one to the two to the k minus one. Well, that means every root is equal to zero. Um, alpha equals, let's see, minus one is also a possibility. Notice that'll zero this part out and then all of these iterates will be minus one. Let's see, is there anything else? I think there's one more and that would be alpha equals minus two. So let's talk our way through that. If alpha is equal to minus two, then we get minus one on the inside there. And then if we raise that to the two to the k, we got plus one, but then every other time after this, we'll get zero. So this is kind of a special case in that it doesn't iterate through just itself infinitely many times. Okay, well, what does that tell us? That tells us that our polynomial can be factored using those roots. It can in fact be factored as capital A times x to the L times x plus one to the M times x plus two to the N power. Now we just have to determine what values of L, M, and N are allowed. Now before we get started talking about which of these exponents are allowed, let's note before we get started talking about which of these exponents are allowed, let's notice that immediately we say we see that a must be equal to 1. And that's because the leading coefficient of the left and the right hand side have to be the same. Leading coefficient on the left hand side is a squared. On the right hand side it's a, but we've already assumed that a is not equal to 0. So that means we've got p of x is equal to x to the l, x plus 1 to the m, and x plus 2 to the n. Okay, so now let's throw that into this functional equation and see what we get. So now we've got p of x minus 1. Well, that's going to be equal to x minus 1 to the l times x to the m times x plus 1 to the n. Okay, and then if we look at p of x plus 1, that'll give us x plus 1 to the l, x plus 2 to the m, and x plus 3 to the n. Now we need to compare the product of those two with p evaluated at x squared minus one. So that's gonna leave us with x squared minus one to the L. And then next we'll have x squared minus one plus one, so that's gonna be x squared to the M. And then finally, x squared plus one to the N. But let's look at this. If we take the product of these top two and compare it to the bottom one, we can see that immediately n has to be equal to zero. Well, that's because the product of the top two has minus three as a root, but the bottom one does not have minus three as a root. Or the bottom one has i as a root, but neither of the top two have i as a root. So all that leads to this exponent of n must be zero. 
Okay, well, let's look at the rest of it. For similar reasons, this exponent m has to be zero, because notice we get a root of minus two here, but not on this right-hand side. But then finally, we're left with just this exponent of L, and notice that's allowed to be anything, because if we take the product of these two terms, we get exactly that term. So like I said, this is okay, which means in the end, we get P of X can be equal to X to the L for L bigger than or equal to zero, and then P of X equals zero. And so notice if L is equal to zero, that recovers this constant polynomial one. So that's built into this solution over here. And that's a good place to stop.